Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So this is the first lecture for my intermediate micro course. And yeah, I know it says lecture note two, budget constraints. Lecture note zero is like the mathematical background. So thinking about derivatives, first derivatives, partial derivatives. Lecture note one is thinking about applications of supply and demand and then basic economic principles. The very end text, I think, starts with budget constraints. I start the class with budget constraints, and then I always just upload those materials separately. So the first lecture is indeed budget constraints, though I say lecture note two. Yeah, it's lecture note two, but it's lecture one, right? Anyway, so if that wasn't confusing enough, here is my comment. This is in the vein of Varian's Intermediate Micro. So I initially made my slides years and years ago um, as a grad student at University of Arizona from Varian and the course has evolved substantially since then however the foundation for the slides come from Varian so I say it is in the vein of Varian's intermediate micro in the vein of is a tip of the hat to David Taub and next level guitar which used to do used to teach people guitar through videos online they might even still be on YouTube and they'd say for instance this song is in the vein of poisons every rose has its thorn anyway so that's that's all that was and right, so the basic idea here is I'm going to start off and I'll give us sort of the, the, the first lecture here taking as our foundation or taking as our starting point, the budget constraint. Next lecture goes into preferences, then utilities, then thinking about choice, which follows actually chapter titles in Varian. And then my course brings in other ideas and other, other texts that are useful. But the, the chapter headings and the lecture headings follow Varian at least for the first half. And so that hopefully that's helpful. The other thing is you heard me mention uh, calculus and derivatives and partial derivatives. We assume a, a calculus prereq. However, what I do is I am careful to realize people had different experiences with calculus and took it at different times. And so whenever we implement calculus and actually anything with math, I like to kind of actually be really deliberate with the steps. And I think that's important to, uh, to help you follow along. So anyway, that is by design. What we will cover today is thinking about budget constraints. This gives us one of the foundational concepts necessary to analyze consumer choice. Consumer choice involves thinking about constrained optimization, thinking about optimization, doing the best we can given the constraints we face, given the best we can given the situation. So, well, doing the best we can follows directly from the consumer's preferences. They have preferences that help us assess what is the best. What is the best we can follows from, given the circumstances, follows from uh, the budget constraint, thinking about what are the limitations faced by the income, the money we have available, and the relative prices of things in the economy, right? And so right now we're going to focus on what, what are the limitations placed on consumer choice from the market. So I'll start off talking about the budget set. The budget set is a consumption or a set of consumption combinations that are affordable. This looks scary. I'll talk about it. it it's going to become very much less scary really soon. All we're going to care about actually is going to be this right here, what I've got highlighted. But I want to show where it comes from. So the budget set is giving us the set of consumption combinations that are affordable. This is giving me the amount of good one. This is the amount of good two. This is a consumption bundle in parentheses. So what this is saying is all such amounts of good one and amounts of good two, all such consumption bundles, such that my expenditure on good one, right? This is the price of good one times the amount of good one. This is the expenditure on good one plus my expenditure on good two, price of good two times the amount of good two is less than or equal to does not exceed the amount of money I have available, right? The amount of money that I've got available cannot be exceeded by my expenditure on the two goods. And this is just saying I have either a positive or zero amount of good one or a positive or zero amount of good two. And then this is set builder notation. This is giving me the set of all such bundles. It's going to be an area on a graph. The set of bundles that exhaust the income line that exactly exhaust the income is the budget line, right? So this is where this holds with equality. This is specifically the set of bundles that are on the budget line. This is the, the collection of bundles that are just or exactly affordable, such that my expenditure on good one and my expenditure on good two is exactly the amount of money I have available. That's the budget line, and we're going to concern ourselves primarily with just the budget line itself. So let's think about this in the context of a simple too good economy. Suppose the consumer has M available to spend on good one and good two. This is the bundle. This is the, uh, this is the amount of good one and good two that the consumer's got. And we'll call this the consumer's consumption bundle. I already talked about P1 and P2. Those are the prices of the two goods. 
and our consumer is therefore able to afford all bundles such that my expenditure on good one plus my expenditure on good two doesn't exceed the money I have available. And then this is gonna be the consumer's budget set. This whole thing is the budget set, and then we're ultimately gonna be interested in where this holds with equality, that's gonna be our budget line. Here's the picture. The budget line is gonna be where my expenditure on good one plus my expenditure on good two is exactly equal to the amount of money I have available. But there's a whole collection of points, ordered pairs, co combinations, bundles of, of good one and good two that are affordable, and those are gonna be those that are in the budget set. Now, I should talk about this a little bit more. So here is my vertical axis labeled with X2. This is the amount of good two. Then my horizontal axis labeled with X1, this is my amount of good one. So suppose I have no good one or no good two. Well, no good one and no good two, then I'd be at the origin, zero, zero, which is affordable because my expenditure would be zero. The maximal amount of good two that I can afford is just my income divided by the price of good two. That's this right here. The maximal amount of good one that I can afford is my income divided by the price of good one, and that's going to be this amount right here. So the endpoints of the budget line are going to be constructed by just the income divided by the price of each good. And these are actually going to be really important points. Ultimately, when we're thinking about utility maximization, sometimes the optimal consumption bundle might be at one endpoint or the other. Then my budget line has the slope of minus P1 over P2 minus p1 over p2, or if this was x and y, it'd be minus px over py, right? So that's going to be the slope of the budget line. Now, very often, and don't let this confuse you, I might refer to this slope as just p1 over p2. And you're like, wait a second, it's got to be minus p1 over p2. Well, right, but we know that this line is always going to be downward sloping, so sometimes we'll speak in terms of absolute value. Also, we'll introduce a concept called the marginal rate of substitution. That'll be the slope of the indifference curve. These are all things we'll, that are going to be yet to come. That's going to be something else that's going to be, by design, negative, but we'll often refer to in absolute value. Don't let that confuse you. It turns out that for our analysis, if you're treating them in negatives, the signs will cancel. If you're treating them in absolute value, we don't have to worry about the sign. right? And so... Yeah, the slope of the budget line, this is going to be what we'll call our price ratio. Yeah, it's got a negative on it, but very often we might report it in absolute value. And as long as we are aware of that, that won't cause problems. All right, the budget set is going to be the collection of all affordable bundles. This is going to include the budget line and all bundles closer to the origin. That's the budget set. The but it's bounded by the budget line. These are going to be the bundles that exactly exhaust, that are just. When you see just, this means exactly affordable. This means that there's no, nothing left over. We've exhausted our budget if we're on the budget line. When the consumer chooses a bundle on the budget line, this exhausts the entire budget, meaning that there's nothing left over to spend on one good or the other, meaning there's necessarily a trade-off if you move between bundles. With some algebra, we can rearrange our budget line, right? Let me solve this for x2. x2 is our vertical, right? x2 is my vertical, so that's like my y. Let me solve this for x2. So m minus p1 over, or sorry, m minus p1, p, or x1. So income minus the expenditure on good one. Then divide through by p2 gives me this, right? So this is like y equals, this is like mx, and this is like b. So this is like our, for, our friend, y equals mx plus b. I wrote this as y equals b plus ax, whatever. So this is like the standard slope form of a slope intercept form of a line. This is the vertical intercept. Ah, of course it is. We saw that here. This is m over p2. That's the vertical intercept. And then the slope, yep, this is minus p1 over p2. That's where this comes from, right? From writing this thing, arranging this in, uh, in slope intercept form. All right, so this is where the slope of the budget constraint came from. Here's the vertical intercept. And then and then all the points that satisfy this equation are the bundles that are just exactly affordable. All right. So I'll return to the important point that choosing bundles lying on the budget line requires a trade-off. And the trade-off is going to happen at a particular rate set by the market. This is going to be determined by the ratio of prices. So what this is, the intuition is, if I'm on the budget line and I move to another point on the budget line, I'm giving up some of one good and I'm getting more of the other. When I, when I give up some of the first good, that means I'm freeing up some of the money that I would have spent on that good. Therefore, I've got more money now to spend and allocate towards the other good. And this is going to occur at this, particular, at this particular ratio. 
Um, let's see. So algebraically, when the consumer wants to stay in the budget line and consume more of, of good one, they must they must consume less of good two. I thought I fixed all my slides. It says uh, I want them to say they. Um, and on Canvas, it, I think it's fixed. All right. The const the so what's happening is when the consumer wants to stay in the budget line and consume more of of one good, they have to consume more of the other good. Uh, when they're consuming more of one good, they have to consume less of the other good. So the constraint then is going to be some small change in the amount of good one and some plus sm some small change in the amount of good two. And then this is just sort of an algebraic manipulation coming from Varian. If we subtract the original budget line, we would get the change in good one, the, the change in the expenditure on good one, plus the change in the expenditure on good two has to be zero. Why? Because when we're moving along the budget line, we're not getting additional money. We are just reallocating where the money is going. And what this is showing is the change in good two divided by the change in good one is going to be equal to the price ratio. All this is to say, this is a slope, right? Change in good two divided by the change in good one. You could take this delta and make this a, make this like a derivative delta, dx two divided by or dx one, right? And then this is going to be minus p one over over p two. So this is like uh, dy dx. The slope of the budget line is going to give us the rate at which the market is willing to substitute one good for the other. We'll call this the price ratio. All right, so before going any further, let me try an example to make this more concrete. So suppose I go into Paradise Bakery with $10 to spend on cookies and coffee. We'll assume the price of cookies is $1, the price of coffee is $2. So if X1 is the quantity of cookies and X2 is the number of cups of coffee, then my budget constraint is going to be my expenditure on good one plus my expenditure on good two cannot exceed, uh, cannot exceed 10. Right? I had $10 available. My expenditure on good one, this is my amount of good one, my amount of cookies times the price of, of cookies plus my amount of coffee times the price of coffee has to be less than or equal to 10. Then the affordable purchases are all the combinations of cookies and coffee that cost less than $10, right? That's my budget set. Uh, more mathematically, this tells me that I can, I can afford all bundles that satisfy this inequality, right? So if I have $10, Paradise Bakery is actually where I was sitting when I made these slides in Arizona. They're not there. Paradise Bakery is not there anymore. But I'd go there and I'd buy cookies and I'd buy coffee, right? And I'd have $10, and this is how much how many how much uh, cookies I could afford, my expenditure on cookies, and then my how much coffee I could afford, my expenditure on coffee, and that would give me all the bundles that would be that would not exceed the $10. So for an example, if that was my budget set. The budget line is going to be given by x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 10. Now, suppose I were to spend all my money on coffee. That's that'd be the amount. So coffee was good too. I could buy five cups, right? So 10 divided by two is five, right? I'd exhaust my budget on coffee. I could buy five cups. Or suppose I spent all my money on cookies. That was good one. Now I can buy uh, 10 cookies, right? So because the price of good one was one. So 10 divided by one is 10 and then I'd have no coffee. And these are the extremal points on my budget line. Uh, even if we only cons uh, only think of discrete goods, there's many other bundles that I could have bought rather than only coffee or only cookies. It could be any of these combinations are on the budget line. Now, for convenience, we will assume goods are infinitely divisible, meaning that you could have fractional cookies, you could sell crumbs, you could have fractional coffee, that's a little bit more plausible. But the idea is we'll typically assume goods are infinitely divisible. So does that make sense? Well, we can always change our units. So suppose I'm not talking about like half a cookie, but I'm talking about half um, half a dozen cookies, for instance, right? If you vary the units, then you could make then you can make uh, you could make the you you could make this a little bit more um, a little bit more plausible. All right. Anyway, so here is the here is the graph corresponding to that example. If I had ten dollars available and the price of coffee was two, I could buy five coffee. If I had ten dollars and the price of cookies was one, I could buy ten cookies. The bundles that would not be affordable. Yeah, I'd like to have ten cookies and five coffee, but I can't afford it because that costs too much. That cost uh, twenty dollars, and I don't have twenty dollars. I have ten dollars. The budget set would be all those that are affordable, but you know, maybe I'd want to exhaust my budget. Maybe I'd want to spend all ten dollars that I'd allocated to coffee and cookies. And so to do that, I have to be on the budget line. Yeah, the budget, the slope of the budget line in this case is going to be one half or minus one half. I'll probably just refer to it in absolute value because the price of coffee 
was uh, the price of coffee was two, the price of good two, the price of cookies was one, price of good one, so minus one over two gives me my slope of my budget line. All right, so here's an exercise. Suppose you have income of $40 to spend, commodity one costs $2 per unit, Co commodity two costs $10 per unit, write down the budget constraint. Um, let me see, so typically, I had not, I'd forgotten that I had this in here. So typically, we do this on the board, and this one's, I mean, you've probably got this already in your mind, right? If you have ten if you have $40, that's gonna be my income. Uh, commodity one cost $2, so it's gonna be 2x plus commodity two cost $10, 10y equals 10. This is gonna be the budget. This is the budget line, right? All right, while traveling abroad, Anne spends all the money in Anne's purse to buy five plates of spaghetti, six oysters. Spaghetti costs eight units of the local currency. Anne has 82 current units of currency in Anne's purse. If S denotes the number of plates of spaghetti and zero denotes the number of oysters per, uh, purchased, write down a budget constraint to describe the set of commodity bundles that Anne could afford with the money in Anne's purse. Uh, I'm going to leave this one. This one shows up as a quiz question, but you think about it. Should I have said that? Nah, I don't care. So anyway, you think about this one and, um, and you could think about, uh, so quiz questions some semesters, I'll say that. So think about what this would, what this would be. And I'll maybe if I, maybe if I remember, I'll put this one in, in the, in the description. All right. As mentioned earlier, there's trade-offs between goods. So when we're choosing between bundles on the budget line, the slope of the budget line gives us the rate at which the market is willing to, to substitute, right? We're thinking about trade-offs. Some of the trade-offs are governed by the market based on the relative prices. Some of the trade-offs are governed by our preferences. We have not yet said anything about what the consumer actually wants. Right now, we're focusing on the budget line. This is just what the market allows. Suppose I'm currently at the at the bundle where I'm spending all my money on coffee. I've got five coffees. If I want to stay on my budget line but buy some cookies, clearly I have to give up coffee to be able to afford some cookies. Each cup of coffee that I give up gives me $2 to reallocate towards cookies. So suppose I bought one less coffee. Now I don't have the $2 that coffee cost. I can spend those $2 on two cookies to remain on my budget line. The change in my consumption of coffee, change in coffee, is a dollar change in, or change in that this is an amount the change in the amount of coffee is one the change in the price was freeing up two dollars the change in my consumption of cookies was two so i gave up one coffee to get two cookies the price ratio then the <clears throat> is going to be equal to the change in coffee that was one divided by the change in cookies that was two that's equal to the ratio of their prices one to two right my change in consumption of cookies, this is outputs or um, amounts, right? I got two more cookies, that's the denominator here. I got one less coffee, that's one. The price, the ratio of prices, right? Price wasn't one and two, the price was, uh, the price of good one of, of cookies was, uh, was one, and the price of good two coffee was two, right? So minus one half. So now, now we're talking about prices, right? The, the ratio of the change in goods is equal to the ratio of the change in, uh, in their prices, right? So this is the price ratio is governing the, the trade-off between the consumption of one good for as I'm reallocating towards consumption of the other. All right, and we see that moving along the budget constraint. Here is a more complicated budget constraint example, and there's some like this on the, on the, on the practice exercises. Suppose I have $20 available. The price of coffee is $3. The price of cookies depends on whether I buy more or less than $10. So the price of, the price of uh, cookies is one initially if I buy less than or equal to 10. It's three if I buy greater or equal to 10. What will my budget constraint look like? All right, so you probably pause the video and sketch this out for yourself. I'm going to show the solution. I'll walk through it because this is a, this is a complicated enough one where I want to make sure to go over it. Okay, so here is the solution. And I'd done this previously. The, f the first thing, remember, the, the price of good two is always three. So then the price of good one changes. This means that the slope of the budget constraint is going to be different at different points. We know my vertical intercept. It's going to be 20 divided by 3. So I can go ahead and mark down the vertical intercept immediately. And we know the slope 
over the first 10 units of good one. It's going to be one third, one divided by three, P1 over P2. We know the slope of the, of the rightmost component. It's going to be three over three. It's going to be one. So that's this right here, right? So the steps for solving one of these where it changes is first find the intercept corresponding to the price that doesn't change. Well, the price of good two is always is always three and I had $20 available. So I know my vertical intercept is always going to be 20 thirds. The next thing to do is find the expect, find the break point. It was at 10 buying 10 units of good of good one after 10 units of good one. That's the point it changes and then find the expenditure to getting to this point. Well, those 10 units, the first 10 cost me $10 because the price for the first 10 is a dollar. So I have expended $10 to get here. Now find what you can do with those $10. I can buy another collection of cookies. This is also going to cost $10, right? But it's going to be 10 divided by three is going to be the amount I can afford. So I'll add to the to the 10 that I'd originally consumed, I can add 10 thirds more. I'll talk about that over here in a second. Or I could spend those $10 on this good. And again, that's going to cost that's going to cost me $10. And I can get 10 thirds of those because the price of good two is 10 or is three. So the steps. First step is find the vertical intercept for the price that in this case, find the intercept for the price of the good that doesn't change. Okay, so 20 divided by three, that's this. Find the break point, it's 10. Find the amount that you've expended to get here. Well, if I consume 10 cookies, I'm now at this kink point, which means I've lost $10. I had $20 originally, so I have $10 that I can spend on something else. I could allocate those $10 to coffee. If so, I'd move up to the budget line. That would be, I could buy 10 thirds coffees. So I'd be here. So this point is going to be 10 cookies and 10 thirds coffee. This is the ordered pair 10 comma 10 thirds. Or I could continue buying cookies. That's going to give me another 10 thirds cookies. So this, this point here is going to be the ordered pair 40 over, thir over 3 comma 0. So what's this going on here? Well, I like working with improper fractions and I, rather than decimals. And in general, the way that I write my exercises and the way that I write exam questions are you should use improper fractions because it makes things simpler because there's nice canceling that can happen. So whenever possible, I'm going to write this as 40 thirds instead of as 10 as 13.3. Also, there's, there's rounding issues and truncating and stuff like that. So let's just keep the fraction. In doing so, what I want to do is I'm going to say I'm going to have 10 thirds cookies here. I need to get a common denominator. Rather than thinking about 10 cookies, I can think of that as 30 over 3 cookies, right? 30 divided by 3 is 10 plus 10 thirds. So let me write this as 30 over 3. That gives me 30 over 3 plus 10 over 3 gives me 40 over 3 cookies, right? So this gives me this endpoint. Notice, as I was saying before, the slope of the first portion of the budget constraint is indeed minus minus uh, 1 over 3. It's going to be one third minus 1 third. So minus P1 over P2 is the slope of the budget constraint. And the slope of the second component, the rightmost component, is going to be minus 3 over 3 or minus 1. All right, so that's how that exercise works. Very good. Oh, we haven't done this yet. Puppy study break. Here's the puppy study break. So this is my puppy. This is Onyx. We call her Ani. So Ani is at the top of the stairs looking down at me, wondering where I'm going. I'm going to make this video. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so far, we haven't said anything. Uh, we've only considered what the consumer can afford. We haven't said anything about what the consumer actually wants. We will get there when we talk about preferences and utility. First, let's think about some additional things with the budget constraint and then close out this lecture. So let's think about changes to the budget constraint and then work on answer or answers to questions like, what if the price of coffee falls? What if the price of cookie falls? What if both fall or rise? What is the amount? What if the amount of money available changes? Okay, well, if the amount of money changes, then this is a change in income. The income entered through the vertical intercept or the vertical uh, through the uh, vertic <laughs> through the numerator of the ordered pair corresponding to the uh, to the intercept. So this right here was 10 over 2, was 5. Now I have 12 over 2, that's 6. This over here was 10 over 1, that was 10. This is now 12 over 1. So if my income increases, it's going to give us a rightward shift of our budget line. The slope's going to be unchanged. It's still minus 1 half. 
Suppose the price of cookie rises from one dollar to two dollars. This is going to shift in. It's going to rot. Sorry, this is going to rotate in my budget constraint. The price of co of coffee didn't change. The price of cookies did. Right. So cookies used to be a dollar. Now cookies are two dollars. Clearly, now I can I can buy less, half as much. Right. Something else that's interesting is now this is going to this is going to affect uh, obviously how many cookies I can buy, but it shrinks my budget set, right? So previously, where my cursor is right now, previously this is a bundle that was affordable. I could buy five cookies and have money left over to buy coffee. After the budget cons after the budget change, this clearly affects my consumption of cookies, but it's also going to affect my consumption of coffee because if the price is $2, I can no longer afford cookies and coffee. I can only afford cookies, right? And so this is going to give rise to our discussion of income and substitution effects and stuff like that later on. But what's changed has been the change in the relative prices. And indeed, that's affected my consumption of both goods. If I was previously consuming a bundle right here, after the price changes, I can only consume here. Or maybe I should be on the vertical, on the, sorry, on the budget constraint. Uh, so I can show that I would have been exhausting my budget. But uh, however, the, the effect is the same. When the price of one good rises, this can affect how much I consume of both goods, though it's going to clearly affect how much I maximally afford of both of, of just the one good that's affected. Uh, question, if all prices are doubled while the money income is unchanged, what happens to the budget to the budget line? Oh, if prices are doubled while money income is unchanged, it'll shift inward. Right, so you'd go from suppose initially the price of both goods was one. Suppose initially the price of both goods was one, so my budget line would go would be right here, go up, it'd be here, and then suppose the price of both goods goes to two. Now the budget would shift down to have intercepts at five and five. So if the price of both goods was one, my intercepts would be at ten. If the price is doubled, my intercepts would be at five. So it'd shift inward. If prices all doubled while money income is unchanged, what happens to the budget line shifts inward. Suppose the price of good X triples, the price of good Y doubles while income stays constant. How does the how does the new budget line compare to the original when drawn on the graph? Um, I don't know if I can do this quickly on this on this page. It's not it's not straightforward to draw. Basically, what you what you what you'd see is I can consume. Uh, I, I, I'm going to get a steeper, I'm going to get an inward shift of the budget line and it's going to be steeper. So the price of good X triples. So this is going to bring in the amount that I could maximally consume. I'll get a, I can consume a third as much good X. The price of good X, or, or the price of good X uh, triples, the price of good Y doubles. I can consume half as much Y, right? So if I can consume half as much Y and a third as much X, it's going to shift in my budget constraint and make it steeper. All right, what's the effect of a quantity tax? So taxes are interesting. This is going to affect, think about how this affects the budget constraint. So with a quantity tax, for instance, the consumer pays a certain amount to the government per unit of the good that's purchased. So 15, 15, what? Yeah, this is, I mean, you know from before, this is an old set of slides. I, I grabbed this off my, I was trying to find the, the lecture. I should have just, I should have taken this from the canvas. Anyway, so uh, 1.5 per unit, for instance, or $15 if we're whatever, so it doesn't matter. So the consumer is going to pay a higher price if there's a tax. So what's the effect of a tax? The effect of the tax is going to be, it's going to effectively raise the price. So what happens when we raise the price? This is going to reduce the amount that we could maximally afford. It's going to bring in the intercept. So the quantity tax of, the, of good one implies the price of good one will be P1 plus the tax. The consumer's budget line becomes steeper, right? Just like the price doubling, suppose the tax effectively made the price of the good double, I don't know, like that. What's going to end up happening? It's going to shift in the, it's going to shift in the, or rotate in the budget line. It's going to make the budget line steeper. What about an ad valorem tax? So this, ad, this gives a tax on the price. So this would be like a sales tax. All I care about here is convincing us that this is going to have a similar effect. So if the price of good one is P1, it's taxed at a rate tau. The consumer is going to pay uh, P to the supplier and then tau times that price to the government. This is like a standard sales tax. The total cost to the consumer is going to be, well, suppose the tax rate tau was 5%, then this would be the total, the total cost to the consumer would be 1.05 times P, right? That's going to raise the price. It's going to reduce the amount that we can buy. So it bring the budget 
budget line, it, it would make the budget line steeper just as before. All right. What about a subsidy? That's the opposite of the tax. Suppose the government gave the consumer some amount of money with each, with each amount, uh, with each unit purchased, this would do the opposite of the tax. So you could have an ad valorem subsidy, which would be a percentage uh, price uh, subsidy, or you could have the standard quantity subsidy. Either way, the tax is going to make the budget, a tax on good one makes the budget line steeper. A subsidy on good one makes the budget line flatter. And so this is just that same language. I don't know. Uh, what about a lump sum tax? Well, this is going to have a shifting effect. This has the effect of shifting the budget line inward or outward. So if you have a lump sum tax, it would shift the budget line inward. Why? Because we deduct the lump sum tax from the income. So these are non-distortionary because this isn't going to affect the relative prices. Um, However, it's going to have the non-distortionary, non-distortionary from the effect from the from the standpoint of assuming marginal reasoning. So comparing the marginal benefit to marginal cost, clearly it's going to affect my budget line, though, right? The lump sum subsidy has the opposite effect. It enlarges, makes the budget line, it makes the budget set larger. It shifts out the budget line. The, the lump sum tax would decrease the budget um, set. All right, so here we discuss budget constraints. We examined some properties of budget sets. We thought about the effects of price and income changes on the budget set, and we thought about taxes. I really just care about taxes from the standpoint of how it changes. It's a, it's a more interesting way to model changes to the budget uh, set or the budget line, but as long as you're comfortable with how the budget line can change via price changes or income changes, then you should be plenty comfortable with with how this changes through taxes and very, yeah so anyway i'll go ahead and conclude here hope you enjoy the video and then i'll see you next time